good morning. Uh, so, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Jonathan Freyhoff. Um, uh, we heard that you were going to be in the New York City area and kind of jump this opportunity to invite you. So, thank you for accepting our presentation. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Freyhoff graduated from Hawaii Medical School, followed by his residency training at Columbia Presbyterian. He then joined the Indian Health Services and worked at the White River Hospital on the White House and Apache Reservation as a primary care physician for several years before switching his path and um, then undergoing fellowship training in endocrinology at the NIH in Bethesda at Royal Arizona. Um, since 2005, he has been the chief of the obesity and diabetes clinical research section, which operates the clinical research units of the NIDK division in Phoenix. He has over 100 peer-reviewed publications, too many to list at this point, and continues to see patients and do clinical care at the Phoenix Indian Medical and Allied Care and Health Services. So thank you again. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. How do I advance the slides? Just to Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so, uh, thank you for inviting me, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm actually feeling a little more nervous at this talk because my talk is in the audience. <laughs> and I, uh, I realize you've never heard me talk about my work. Um, and uh, I, I don't mind, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this will be about 50 minutes. Um, I don't mind being interrupted with questions, which I'll leave to the end. Um, there will be a lot of slides with dots on them, and I apologize, that's what we do there. So, um, so I'm, I just want to give you uh, a little I'm going to give you some background, both on why uh, NIDK, which is a part of intramural NIHs in Phoenix, about how we measure energy expenditure, a little bit about components of energy expenditure and its determinants. I'm assuming you people here don't always think about these things, we think about them every day. And then more about sort of the research we've done recently. Um, so, just a few, because I know everyone from the East Coast is <laughs> not familiar with Arizona, but I want you to know a few facts about Arizona. So. We can still text and drive there. That's legal. <laughs> Some people have suggested that maybe we should drink, text, and drive. Then we're not as anxious when we're texting. Um, if you do see us texting and you're angry, just remember that one in six of us, at least, has a gun in our car. Um, we don't do daylight savings time at all, so that's for the rest of you. We never change our clocks. Um, it is true, I know you all believe this, that as soon as you cross the Mississippi, our IQ drops about 15 points. Um, it goes down another five points because of the Arizona heat, and when it's over 110, it goes down even further. But if we travel that to California, our IQ does go back up. Um, when it's 119 in Phoenix, you cannot fry an egg on top of your car. I've tried that. It just ruins the paint. Um, and, and frankly, I don't know anything about your weather or anybody else's. All I know is whether it's sunny or not uh, there, and mostly it's sunny, and whether it's warm or hot. So when you guys are having a nor'easter, I'm probably standing outside my feet, my pool, and my shorts and t-shirts. Okay, so a little bit about why NADK is there in Phoenix. So the reason it, uh, we're in Phoenix has to do with the prevalence of diabetes in a specific Native American community. Uh, this is a community of Pima Indians called Gila River Indian Community. There are several communities of Pimas actually in Arizona. Um, as you can see here, there is so you can see here, this is the prevalence of diabetes in this population. So you can see uh, as people, as uh, females get into their 40s and 50s, nearly half have diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Um, and this is, so this is sort of a blurry photo, but this is a picture of the reservations in Arizona. This is where I was, for Apache, where I worked for a while. This is the Gila River Indian community in blue. Phoenix is right here. So it's about 40 miles southeast of Phoenix. Maybe started it all. Now the reason how things started has to do with a physician named Dr. Peter Bennett. Peter Bennett was a rheumatologist who came out to uh, two areas of the West, and he was actually interested in um, arthritis. And his first, he wanted to see if uh, populations that lived in traditionally warm versus cold climates had different rates of rheumatoid arthritis. So he came out in '63. So he chose the Blackfeet of Montana as his cold weather population, and the Pima Indians of Southern Arizona as his warm weather population. And he came to do an arthritis survey in 1963. And he found out, first of all, despite the warm weather, Native Americans had a lot of autoimmune disease. They had a lot of rheumatoid arthritis. 
worms, but he also found they had a lot of diabetes. So he went back and tested his samples, which he was going to test for rheumatoid factor, over half had elevated glucose. So he came back in 1965 and started an ongoing study to look at risk factors for diabetes and obesity in the Gila River Indian community population and recruited within a certain area of that population, tried to recruit everybody every two years for a research exam, ages five and up. And um, this study continued, this longitudinal study continued from 1965 to 2007. In 1970, Phoenix Indian Medical Center, where I worked, was built, and a research unit, Congress actually line item to money for a research unit to be built on top of it to, to look more specifically at um, especially metabolic diseases that affected Native Americans. Initially gallbladder disease, but it evolved to look really at diabetes and obesity. Um, in 1982, my current boss, Clifton Bogardis, came and really started doing longitudinal studies looking at more detailed measures of insulin physiology. So using hyperglycemic uh, hyperinsulin implants, he built a uh, whole room indirect calorimeter, which I'll show you, and started doing biopsies and stuff. Um, I, now, the relationship with the tribe, so the tribe is a small, it's only about 2,000 people. Uh, Indian land is sovereign, and so to be able to do research on tribal land, you have to get tribal approval. And there, there's always been some political aspects to doing research on tribal lands, and in uh, there's, there was a movement essentially to have NIH stop doing research. So in 2009, the tribe halted research within the bounds of the community, meaning we couldn't recruit their allowed us to use ongoing collected data and samples, but has not approved any on-reservation studies. So some of the early studies we, that we, you're probably familiar with are all, uh, take, you know, are all based on that population, but our, our studies that I'm going to show you, our new studies, are based on general population studies. Okay, and we have five sections, so I'm just head of one section, but we have, a, we have there's over 100 people on our branch, so we have a um, epidemiology and clinical research section. We have a genetic section joined by Leslie Bear, genetic epidemiology and chronic kidney disease. And that's us. So that's Phoenix Indian Medical Center in the middle of now not the desert because it's watered. And that arrow goes to my office. Uh, and so our unit has, it's a full metabolic research unit that occupies that top floor. So we have a, our own metabolic kitchen. We have two indirect whole room, whole room indirect calorimeters. Um, we can do bomb calorimetry directly of school food and urine. I'll show you why that's important in a moment. Uh, and we also have this, these fancy ways of measuring energy intake using these automatic vending machines. Okay, so a little bit about measuring energy expenditure, because this is one of the things that we're, I think, experts on. Um, so just some background. So um, in the 1700s, Lavoisier theorized that uh, a burning candle needs oxygen and releases heat, and so organisms must need to do that as well. So he decided to try to measure energy expenditure in an animal. And so actually the first animal he did, this, this picture is inaccurate, was a guinea pig. And he did this experiment, he put a guinea pig in a little cylinder here, he surrounded it with ice, uh, it melted the water, and he was able to sort of estimate how much heat combustion the guinea pig was releasing and estimate its energy expenditure. So if you do that, if you measure how much heat someone is producing, that's called direct calorimetry. It's measure actually heat dissipation from the body. And you can do that in there. You can actually build a room to do that. But it's actually, it's very cumbersome and it's, it's what we call, it's, it's slow. So the way that most people measure um, energy expenditure is by what we call indirect calorimetry. And so indirect calorimetry relies on um, measurement of gas exchange. And so we know that nutrient metabolism creates energy, so if you, if you metabolize and break bonds, and the extraction of energy via this oxidation, this burning of fuels, results in consumption of oxygen and uh, production of CO2 in water. And so if you can measure how much oxygen is consumed and how much CO2 is produced, and you know some assumptions about how much energy it takes to do that, um, then you can actually get a very good estimate of energy expenditure. So I didn't want to bore you with the formula, but if you all want to quickly write down the formula that they use, you're welcome to do that. There's actually two formulas in use. Um, they produce ex almost exactly the same results. So how do we do that in Phoenix? So you can actually do that in a special room called the whole room indirect calorimeter. 
we call it a metal bottle chamber or we just call it the chamber. Um, when I'm giving talks, especially to certain audiences, I've been discouraged from using the word chamber because it sounds a little medieval. Um, it's kind of like a hotel room though. So it's eight by 10 feet. Uh, it's got a bed, it's got a toilet, it's got a sink, it's got a desk, it's got a TV. People spend 24 hours in, the, in our chambers. Um, the way it works is they eat breakfast, then they go in. There's an airlock. So, so let me show let me show you how these chambers work. So, um, it's not sealed. So air is pumped in. It's circulated. Sorry, now I'm sorry. Don't have a point. It's circulated. Okay, and then it's taken out. It's so the, and then this mixed air, which is a combination of remember someone's in there. So it's a combination of how much oxygen they've consumed and CO2 produced, plus the air flowing in. It says taken out and sampled. It's actually cooled and dehumidified, and then it's sampled in separate oxygen and CO2 analyzers. And what these do essentially is what we're looking at is these are called differential analyzers. We're looking at the rate of change of the oxygen and CO2. And um, these are done by linear algorithms. I won't go into details. I don't even quite understand all the math that's behind it. But it gives you a rate of change of oxygen and CO2 over time. And based on that rate of change, you can estimate energy expenditure. And you can do it quite accurately. And actually, the coefficient of variation for measuring energy expenditure, if you put the same person in the room twice, is like 2%. Probably better than any other measurement anyone does anywhere. Um, and so thinking about what makes up our total energy expenditure per day. So there's a few important aspects to it. So obviously one big thing that's quite variable is your activity related energy expenditure. So this is how much you use when you exercise, just walk around. Um, the energy expenditure we're primarily interested in is the lower part. So there's the resting metabolic rate. So that's the rate that you're using right now, sitting, you know, the rate your liver needs to produce glucose, cardiac um, uh, output and all that. Um, and then there's this kind of mutable area in between that we call, that's called diet-induced thermogenesis. So diet-induced thermogenesis is the energy expenditure increase that, that you're, that's produced when you eat. And we consider that to be composed of two components. And these are theoretical components. One is the obligatory component, so that's the amount that you need to break the bonds to digest and absorb food. And then there's the facultative component. So the facultative component is the part I think we all want to believe results in either resistance to weight gain or failure to lose weight. So I just want to give you a few definitions, because this, this appears at least in our literature a lot. So, so what is, so diet-induced thermogenesis, also in the animal literature, and I'll show you a few examples, is called specific dynamic action. And that is the energy expenditure cost above resting metabolic rate for consuming and digesting nutrients. And I'll show you a few examples of that in a second. Obligatory diet-induced thermogenesis, which I mentioned, is again the cost of absorbing, digesting, and storing nutrients. And we should be able to measure that. We should know what that is. Facultative diet-induced thermogenesis is the energy expenditure cost not explained by this obligatory portion. So that's the part we think varies between individuals. And I think, you know, in the public and everywhere else, people think certain people really increase their energy expenditure more when they eat, so they can't gain weight in certain people. An adaptive thermogenesis is the change in energy expenditure beyond that explained by changes in weight. So again, this idea that some people adapt greater, have increased energy expenditure when they gain weight, or less increased energy expenditure accounts for their ability to maintain weight or not gain. Okay, so diet-induced thermogenesis or specific dynamic action, how do you measure that? So the way it's commonly measured, obviously, is giving a meal. So this is just an example. Um, so this is someone's resting metabolic rate here. It might be easier if I sit, actually. Um, you give them a meal, and you can see their energy expenditure increase to a peak, and then dissipated over a number of hours to days. Uh, and you can do this using what's called a rest. You know, we do it in our whole room indirect calorimeter or our chamber, but you can do this using a, a cart if you wait long enough. Um, I'll tell you that most of the studies, a lot of the studies that measure this, um, their limitation is they don't wait long enough. They don't wait for the the action of the meal to dissipate to, for the energy expenditures to get back to their resting metabolic rate. So their estimates of diet-induced thermogenesis are essentially inaccurate. 
So you can measure this in all kinds of species. So um, here is a specific dynamic action or diet induced thermogenesis measured in this snake, a python. So obviously a python takes days and days to digest. So you have to wait days for the rest of the metabolic rate in the python to get back to normal. Dogs have actually a very rapid metabolic rate and here's humans. So humans, usually diet induced thermogenesis effect usually lasts somewhere between four and six hours. And this is what it looks like over 24 hours in our metabolic chamber. So this is uh, the same individual. So this is someone undergoing chamber during fasting. So we don't give them any, they don't have any caloric intake over time. Zero is when they, so this is not a 24 hour clock. This is when they enter the chamber here, which is in the mornings. And this is uh, when they're fed the purple line. So you can see there's a difference in energy expenditure. So this is energy, I'm sorry, this is energy expenditure on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. So you can see when they're fed, energy expenditure is clearly higher compared to fasting. Okay. So energy expenditure is very, very much tied to body size. Um, so bigger people, so I, I, I always tell people, um, probably a lot of you know this already, but uh, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, I think it's this may be the most important thing, is that bigger people have higher energy expenditure. And so uh, it's, you know, uh, I think there's a, uh, there's, I think there's a common perception that there are some people who can eat only 500 calories and not lose weight. And I'm here to tell you that's, that's not the case. Uh, and it, it's hard to believe, and even my wife's a pediatric endocrinologist, and she even occasionally hears me says, there must be somebody out there who only eats, because my patients say, and <laughs> I, I completely understand that. But the reality is, is that if someone is 300 pounds, they're not eating 500 calories a day. They're under reporting. Um, so this is a graph of fat-free mass, that's lean body mass, that is everything is not fat, versus 24-hour energy expenditure. And this is, again, measured in our chamber. And you can see there's a very nice correlation between um, fat-free mass, body size, and energy expenditure. And so really the main determinants of energy expenditure are fat-free mass, and then there's an additional contribution of fat mass, uh, age, gender, uh, and ethnicity to that, that accounts for another 5%. What it means, though, is that there's a, that there's that most of the energy expenditure is accounted for by body size. So there's a, a very small fraction that's unaccounted for that we're trying to uh, study to see if it influences weight change. So our unit is very interested in energy balance. And so I'm going to actually just show you, what I'm showing you is just a fraction of the studies we do. We do we have 10 or 12 ongoing studies that look at all aspects of energy balance, from energy intake to energy excretion. Um, but I'm going to concentrate on energy expenditure, which is one side of the energy balance equation. Um, and so one question always is, is, does lower energy expenditure predict weight gain? Uh, and the answer, at least in, and this is, so these are, these are studies done from the Gila River Indian community over time. And so we've had longitudinal studies going on, so we can do baseline measures and we can do follow-up weights. And so uh, remember that energy expenditure is very tied to body size, so it's very important to adjust energy expenditure for body size before you interpret its effect. And so you can see here, this is rate of weight change on the y-axis and energy expenditure adjusted for determinants on the x-axis. And you can see that people with relatively higher energy expenditure tend to gain less weight over time. And if you measure their body fat, their fat mass, that's true also. But this effect is pretty weak. So for every 100 calorie decrease in energy expenditure, it correlates to about a 0.2 kilogram per year change in weight. So it's not a huge effect, even in this population. And whether energy expenditure really affects weight gain is, to, is very controversial because the results in other populations are all over the place. So I'm just going to show you. So. Uh, so here's a study from Amy Luke in Chicago, who's one of our colleagues, and, and in her hands at least, uh, she found the opposite results. So uh, individuals with higher energy expenditure actually gained more weight over time. This is a study in Italy that was consistent with what we showed, that relatively lower energy expenditure predicts greater weight change. And this is a study from Mike Jensen's group that showed there's no effective energy expenditure on weight change. So at least from a static standpoint, if you measure any energy expenditure during what we call energy balance, if there's an effect, it's pretty weak. Um, but uh, people don't spend most of their time in energy balance. 
So uh, energy expenditure measured in energy balance is probably not an accurate reflection of what we're doing day to day. So um, because ener we know that energy balance is a dynamic process. So people tend to overeat, but then they undereat, and actually energy expenditure changes with as people over and under eat, as I showed you. Um, and so this idea that there are certain people whose energy expenditure increases more or decreases more with energy intake uh, is part of what is now called the thrifty genotype or phenotype hypothesis. Now this is a idea that's evolved over time. So Robert Neal, uh, James Neal, who first proposed this idea, was actually proposing, he's a geneticist at Michigan, he was actually proposing this as a, as a gene that there was a genotype uh, in individuals that would lead to insulin overproduction uh, during food intake. That individuals who had a greater ability to produce insulin during food intake uh, were, would, that would favor storage of adipose tissue and that would protect them during times of famine. Um, but even he, he evolved this genotype phenotype over time so that now we think of it as um, it's a focus on evolutionary driftiness. So it's, it's focused now on energy conservation. So it's the idea that um, hunter-gatherer populations over time had periods of feast and famine. To survive famine, you had to be able to conserve energy, uh, meaning you had to build up adipose tissue during times of food intake. And so there had to be populations of people who, whose energy expenditure would decline a lot when there wasn't food and increase uh, less when there was food, favoring storage. And so now in a time of plentiful food, of course, uh, these people would tend to gain a lot of weight uh, because they were predisposed to gain weight during times of overeating. Um, and at least in mice, you can see, so mice have an incredible, some mice models have an incredible ability to increase their energy expenditure when you overeat. So this was a study originally done, this actually looked at, I'm not going to talk about brown fat today, but this actually looked at the effect of brown fat on energy intake. But if you let a mice overeat here, you can see, so this is a control mice and this is a mice eating a cafeteria diet. And um, during the cafeteria diet, they eat approximately twice as much as they would otherwise eat. Now when mice eat twice as much, their energy expenditure also goes up two times, right? That's perfect. So that's complete protection against weight gain which I think we all want to believe that occurs in some people. That's not quite true in humans. So uh, in humans, when you overfeed them, their energy expenditure doesn't go up as much. So this is an old, older study done on our unit, and this is one of the studies that led us to do what we're doing now. So this is a study done in our chamber. So these are this is energy expenditure measured here, and this is different states. So this is a baseline. So this is energy expenditure measured during fasting, as you can see, compared to when uh, individuals are fed an energy balance meal over time. Uh, energy expenditure in the chamber is less. This is again energy expenditure measured during what we call energy balance. So energy balance, we're trying to feed them as much as they we think they're going to burn. Uh, and then this is energy expenditure measured uh, during overfeeding. So this is 200% of their energy needs. So it's massive overfeeding. So you can see here, oops, this is the change in energy expenditure with fasting compared to the change of energy expenditure with overfeeding. It doesn't get anywhere near to the 100% that happens in mice. So the maximum that people increase their energy expenditure with overfeeding might be 15 to 20%. However, there's a relationship here. So individuals who increase their energy expenditure more with overfeeding tend to decrease their energy expenditure less with fasting. Remember, that's the concept that I presented as the hunter-gatherer idea. There's a population of people, uh, and they'd actually fall into this group, who decrease their energy expenditure more with fasting, so are able to conserve energy more when they don't have food, and then increase it less when food is available. And similarly, there's a population who can do the opposite. And so we call them, I mean, these are relative terms, thrifty and spendthrift energy expenditure phenotypes. And that is what we're interested in. So proving these exist takes a lot of time and effort, and that's what our unit does. And so I'm going to show you a series that we do very, these very careful inpatient studies, um, and we couple them with longitudinal follow-up. And I'm going to go take you through some of these studies. So one way to do this, so we, so we have an inpatient unit, so we can, we can admit people. We have studies that we admit people for 13 weeks. We do compensate them. 
they are pretty bored during that time, but they do follow our instructions. So this is uh, one study where we admit people for 10 weeks. So we admit them, uh, we do a, these are essentially healthy, in this case, uh, obese individuals. Uh, we screen them for diabetes, um, and then we, they uh, are admitted to our unit. We do a series of baseline studies. We do a very careful study that, so we measure their energy expenditure twice during energy balance. The first time, we just do a measurement of energy balance. We feed them about what we think they're going to burn. And then we take that exact measure of energy expenditure and feed it to them again in the second metabolic chamber. So we can actually very precisely calibrate how much energy they're burning. Then we overfeed them and fast them. So we get a phenotype based on how much their energy expenditure changes. And in this particular case, we kept them on our unit for six weeks and we underfed them. We gave them 50% of their weight maintenance energy needs. During that time, we measured everything, every energy in and out we could do. So uh, we made duplicate meals. We and we uh, gave them one at random. We actually fed a liquid meal. One at random to the participant, one we actually bombed for direct measurement of calories. We collected their stool and marked it for a measurement of calories. We collected their urine. We did energy expenditure measurements. We measured their physical activity. We did all that. Um, so all right, we used it for our metabolic kitchen. They stayed in our, this is a picture of one inside of one of our metabolic chambers. Uh, we measured their stool by urine and food by direct calorimetry. These are actually um, techniques that we developed at our unit, and we measured their physical activity the whole time they were there. Um, and so this has happened. This happens when you what, what happens when you overfeed and fast uh, these individuals. So again, you know, we overfed them 200% of what they needed for 24 hours just to see what their energy expenditure response was. We fast them, and you can see again. My point is, is that um, this is an obese population, but um, their energy expenditure really doesn't increase that much. You know, this is 200%, and their energy expenditure only increases about 8%. When you fast them, their energy expenditure decreases about 10%. Um, and so here's, after the baseline period, here's their weight loss uh, over time, over the 42 days that they were on our liquid diet. And you can see there's a lot of variability here. So these are, you know, everyone's fed 50% of, of what they should 50% of their what we call weight maintenance energy needs, so they're all getting essentially the same reduction in diet, and yet there's a large variability in weight change by the end of the study. And so we're very interested in whether these energy expenditure phenotypes could predict this weight change. And the answer was it did. And it only took 12 people to show this. It was actually a very strong effect. So what I'm showing you here is on the y-axis, this is percent weight loss here, and this is the change in energy expenditure during fasting here in percent. We do it in percent because people do have different body sizes, and we do it in percent, it kind of normalizes for body size. And so, at least in this very careful inpatient study, what I can show you is we can, I mean, I think this, for us, this is proof that there is, even in an obese population, evidence of thrifty energy expenditure phenotypes. Because individuals who decrease their energy expenditure less with fasting, so who tend not to conserve energy, lost more weight. And the individuals who dropped their energy expenditure more, so were, were thriftier, uh, lost less weight. Um, and again, this is under controlled conditions. And remember that the chamber was done prior to the weight loss period, so this was predicting. And this, is, this was our hypothesis that we could prove this. Um, now, because we had measured everything, we actually could actually calculate exactly what their energy deficit was. And I can, I'm not going to show you the graph. But I can assure you that we actually were able to, based on how much weight we calculated they should have lost, based on how much fat mass and fat-free mass we calculated, uh, we were actually able to account for almost every calorie that they lost. And the, the deviation overall was like 14 calories or something that we were missing. And so if you divide these people into phenotypes based on their baseline chamber, so based on the median split between how they responded to fasting, you can see this is the days they were on our caloric restricted diet, and this is what we call their accumulated energy deficit. So these are all the calories we calculated they should have lost over time. And you can see the spendthrift people lost considerably more calories over time than the thrifty people. So again, at least in, it, in our these very careful inpatient studies, uh, proved to us at least that we could identify these phenotypes and that they could be important in explaining the variability of weight change. But so what? 
Um, these are carefully controlled conditions. Hardly anybody can do this. Um, and uh, although it indicates the presence of thrifty versus spendthrift phenotypes, I think the question is, how viable are these in free living conditions? Um, and so at the same time we initiated this study, we actually initiated another. So these, these studies take a long time to do. Um, we initiated another study. And so the research questions for this study I'm just going to highlight is we wanted to confirm if in a free living conditions, if it's changes in energy expenditure, again with overfeeding and fasting, as an index of what we call adaptive thermogenesis, or this thrifty spendthrift phenotype, we predict weight changes, uh, body weight changes, and follow. And we had another interest here, which is that you can maybe magnify the effect of adaptive thermogenesis if you alter the macronutrient content of the diet. And that is particularly true if you alter the protein content. So these are some, um, you know, in, in our studies we like to say we kind of recycle the same topics every 30 years. So it's been about, when we start, you know, about started this was about 30 or 40 years, so we were ready for this. Um, so these are studies done in the 1960s by Miller and Mumford, and they looked at weight gain uh, over time, uh, varying the overfeeding diet by the amount of protein they gave people. So they admitted people, uh, actually these, they weren't admitted, these were outpatients, they gave them uh, an excess of about 1,400 calories a day, and they varied the protein content. And then they, so this is the weeks on the diet, this is their estimate of the cost of weight gain. So if they, they knew exactly how many calories they were feeding them, and then they made an estimate, if they gained all the weight as uh, fat, they should gain weight up here. If they gained the weight as two-thirds fat, then their weight gain should have been here. And you can see here that they gave them a high-protein overfeeding diet and a low-protein overfeeding diet. And despite the fact that the amount of calories were similar, individuals who had the low-protein diet really gained less weight consistently over time. So somehow, even though they, these people were estimated to gain about five kilos in weight, they gained about, on average, one kilo. So they were wasting a lot of energy, despite the fact that they were eating the same amount of calories. So it indicated that low protein overfeeding would magnify this adaptive thermogenic effect. And um, MJ Stock, who, who did some of the original overfeeding studies and identified ground fat as a cause of increasing energy expenditure with overfeeding, at least in rodents, um, quantified this um, in this way, in this review paper. So here's overfeeding uh, diets that vary by dietary protein and the cost of weight gain. And you can see there's sort of a check shape effect here. So diets that are very, very low in protein seem to increase the cost of weight gain. Um, and this has actually been confirmed. So our colleagues in Pennington, who are probably one of the few units who do sort of a similar crazy long-term inpatient studies as we do, have done these overfeeding studies. And so they gave people, they overfed people for eight weeks and they varied their protein content. And you can see here, this is low protein here, uh, and this is a sort of normal protein, a high protein diet. And so individuals who overate a low protein diet did tend to gain less weight over time. However, they gained the same amount of body fat. So when you looked at um, the differences in lean body mass, you can see those who overate low protein tended to, if anything, lose lean body mass, or lose fat free mass whereas the high protein group bring fat free mass. So that means in terms of overfeeding protein, the reason people don't gain as much weight has to do with the fact that they're gaining fat mass and not lean body mass. It's a quick question, very interesting. Um, in terms of nutritional components of the diet, otherwise, if you were reducing protein, were you replacing it with carbohydrate or fat, or how is that addressed? Uh, yeah. So in this case, um, they sort of balance the fat and carbohydrate, but it's always difficult because you can't obviously change one thing without another. And this has come up with us, which I'll show you. Yeah. So the inpatient, yes. Yeah, so the inpatient study that I showed you, they were the, the they were allowed to have prediabetes. So they, there was some relative insulin resistance. We didn't do we didn't do um, clamps on them to actually measure their insulin resistance. I suspect that more obese individuals were, you know, had some degree of insulin resistance. For this study I'm going to show you, actually, these people were selected to be relatively less insulin resistant. This is the outpatient study. Um, but what I can tell you is the obese individuals fell along the spectrum of what I'm going to show you in this study. So, um, so, so we wanted to also show that these phenotypes were relevant to an outpatient setting. So the other study that we've done over time is 
this one, where we uh, admit people, we again put them on a weight maintaining diet. We do the same kind of chamber I mentioned, so we do this very care careful calibration of energy balance. It's very important to get a very good energy balance measurement of energy expenditure. So you have to make sure that the calories you feed them very precisely matches the energy expenditure you measure. And so we have a very precise way of doing that. And then these people underwent, this was a different study, they underwent um, overfeeding diets over 24 hours in a metabolic chamber that varied in macronutrient content. And they did five of them and a fasting one. And they were done in random order. There's a three-day washout period between each. And then we have follow-ups. And then these people were discharged. They were discharged without diet instruction. And we followed them. And we're, our plan is to follow them for up to seven years if we can get them back. And so um, these are the diets we gave them. So uh, the energy, so the uh, energy balanced diet, and this is typical of our unit, is about 50% carbohydrate, 30% fat, 20% protein. Um, they also underwent uh, uh, a diet in our metabolic chamber, in which they they were given no uh, calories. They they could consume liquids, but non-caloric liquids. And then we overfed them 200% of, of what we measured their energy expenditure needs were, and we varied the uh, macronutrient content of the diet. So here's your question. Um, so we gave them a very, very low protein diet, so 3% protein, and we gave it to them in two forms. One, we actually discontinued early because at the time we didn't think we were getting any useful information. But again, um, one of the low protein diets was higher in fat, one was higher in carb. We also overfed them normal protein overfeeding diets uh, that varied by carbohydrate <coughs> content or fat content. So we gave them a high carb diet, a high fat diet, and then we also, we actually replaced the low protein, high carb diet with a high protein diet overfeeding diet. Also, we can measure their energy expenditure changes over 24 hours in our chamber to see if it predicted weight change over time. And so this is how we do these. So we admit them. They have a DEXA. We do an oral glucose tolerance test. They go in our metabolic chamber twice during energy balance. We do measure blood before and after each chamber session. And they're kept on our unit. This study happened to go for about six weeks. Uh, in between each measurement of energy expenditure, there's a three-day washout period. And then they go back in our metabolic chamber overfed. And, yeah. and because they're in a chamber, we can actually monitor what they eat, so we know. Uh, we have a very good record of um, them eating everything we give them. Uh, and then we discharge them, and then we follow them up. And so I'm just going to show you, so I know, this is, I know, way back, and I'm sorry that you're about to see a series of dots, um, but this is just replication of what I showed you originally. So we're able to show again, and this is in a more diverse population, that there is a relationship between the increase in energy expenditure with overfeeding and the decrease in energy expenditure with fasting. So in a more diverse population, that includes you know, women and people of diverse adiposity and diverse races, we could replicate this finding. And here's just the changes in energy expenditure when you overfeed people. So uh, this is compared to their energy balance chamber. So again, you can see with fasting, people's energy expenditure decreases. Uh, energy expenditure increases actually the most when you give them a high carbohydrate uh, overfeeding chamber. So it increases by almost 14%. And interestingly, the smallest decrease in energy expenditure occurs with a low protein overfeeding. So despite the fact that earlier studies had demonstrated that low protein overfeeding seems to increase the cost of weight gain, it doesn't at least increase energy expenditure in an acute fashion when we measure it. Are those adjusted for changes in body composition? No. Energy balance. So their percent changes. So, you know, everybody's energy expenditure measurement is different, but that's also tied to their body size. So if we do as a percent, it kind of factors out the body yeah. is this difference. But they're not adjusted, no. Yeah, it's not adjusted. No. If you did adjust. You'd, it's very similar, yeah. If you do the raw values or adjusting, yeah, you get very similar results. Uh, and these are just the results just in a minute-by-minute -minute basis in our uh, chamber. So again, people enter here. This is uh, the blue line here is the fasting chamber where we don't give them anything to eat over 24 hours. Um, they have breakfast before they go in. So here's the spike you see with lunch, dinner, and a snack. Um, the purple here is the high carb diet here, light purple. And then the um, green is the, is the low protein overfeeding. And this is when they're sleeping. So by the time people go to sleep, the diet-induced thermogenic effect in most of the diets has worn off. And so we'll often use sleeping metabolic rate as a surrogate of resting metabolic rate in our metabolic chamber. So when we did these measurements, and we did follow up on these people at least at six months, we were able to show that some of these phenotypes did predict weight change. And so I'm just going to point out, in particular, 
um, a couple of them. So this is uh, with fasting. So remember, so I showed you the inpatient data. So this is outpatient data, which is a little noisier, uh, but still seems to be true. So individuals who, this is change in energy expenditure during fasting here, and this is weight change that followed here over six months. So individuals who decreased their energy expenditure less with fasting, after six months, they gained less weight, actually had lost a little weight over time. Um, this was also true with low protein overfeeding. So remember, low protein overfeeding had the least effect on energy expenditure, but at least in outpatient free living conditions, an increase in energy expenditure with low protein overfeeding uh, predicted less weight gain over time. And then interestingly, with and this was all, I just want to say, I know these look like random number generators, and I understand that, but we actually had written all this into our protocol prior to um, the analysis. Um, but when we looked at high-carb overfeeding, uh, we found the opposite. And I'll get back to this, but individuals had a greater increase in energy expenditure with high-carbohydrate overfeeding. And these are, these are big increases. Actually, we're the ones who gained more weight. And when we put them all into a model, we could actually identify phenotypes of who might gain weight. So the thriftier people tended to have lower increases in energy expenditure to low-protein overfeeding and higher energy expenditure increases with high-carb overfeeding. So they formed a unique group, and they were considered the thrifty phenotype people. And then there was a spendthrift phenotype people who had the opposite. So keep both in mind. So the question is, why did we see, why were these particular two phenotypes important in weight regulation? So for the high carb overfeeding, I'll get back to that. Um, why did an increase in energy expenditure predict greater weight change? Did it have to do with dietary choices, some kind of inflammatory response, increased hunger? Keep that in mind. Uh, for the low protein overfeeding, um, we wondered if it could be mediated by either genetics or in particular we're interested in this one hormone which uh, the folks at Pennington had already identified as increasing with low protein overfeeding and that's FGF21 or fibroblast growth factor 21 which is I think under study as an agent to treat diabetes but we think may also mediate weight change. So fibroblast growth factor 21 is expressed in a lot of different tissues uh, its circulating form is mainly produced through the liver. Uh, it's been implicated in the adaptive energy expenditure response to both starvation. It increases a lot when mice are fed a low protein versus normal protein diet, and the same is true in humans. And I'll just show you that briefly. So here's um, here's FDF21 response in mice and rats following low protein overfeeding. You can see it increases dramatically. And then this is the same study I showed you before that was done at Pennington. You can see that following a low protein overfeeding, FGF21 plasma circulating one increased dramatically. So we were interested in whether FGF21 might mediate our low protein effect. And so we measured it before and after our chambers. And this is what we found. So again, this is plasma FGF21 here. These are all the different measurements of energy expenditure in our chamber that I showed you, or the different dietary conditions. And I want to just focus on these last two, which is the low protein overfeeding and under two different conditions, one varied in fat, one varied in carbohydrate. We actually had stopped this one, but we realized that it was important to go back and measure it when we found this. So following the low protein overfeeding, this FGF21 increases by 300%. So I don't know how many of you are in the hormone business, but that's like a huge increase, especially in such a short period of time for any hormone. And um, when we looked at individuals who had done both the low protein overfeeding chambers, we found that the increase was actually very highly correlated. Uh, and the fact that it increased both with the varying conditions of high carb, of low protein, despite the fact that we manipulated the carbohydrate or fat balance, indicated to us that it was the low protein effect that was affecting the FGF21. And so um, when we looked at whether this change in FGF21 concentration was related to the change in energy expenditure with low protein overfeeding, it was. So individuals who increased their FGF21 concentration more increased their energy expenditure with low protein more. Uh, and that was true on both diets. Uh, furthermore, um, I showed you before, and this is now in a larger population, individuals who increased their energy expenditure more with low protein overfeeding tend to gain less weight over time. So we really think that low protein overfeeding magnifies the ability to detect adaptive thermogenesis and, and gives us an ability to phenotype people in terms of their predisposition to weight gain. 
And you can see here that the increase in FGF21 concentration also predicted weight change. So individuals who increased their FGF21 more tended to gain less weight, in fact, lost weight over time. And when we were very into modeling, there were a lot of statisticians. When we put them both in the same model, it was FGF21 that was the dominant effector of this, which means FGF21 may mediate weight change over time or weight maintenance. So, um, so FGF21 increases dramatically with low protein overfeeding. Uh, and does not seem to be an effect of fat or carbohydrate. Um, this FGF21 concentration increase is associated with the increase in energy expenditure and mediates the effect of the increase in energy expenditure of low protein overfeeding on weight change. And so we are starting to think of, we call it, we think of FGF21 as almost a, a spendthrift hormone. Um, now I'm just going to back up for a moment uh, and talk about the high carbohydrate issue. So I, I showed you before that People who increase their energy expenditure more with high carbohydrate overfeeding also gain weight, kind of opposite of what we think in terms of energy expenditure dynamics. So why is that? So we had, during the study, also began to ask, as people got out of the chamber, uh, how hungry they were and how much they wanted to eat. And so we had some rating scales on some people uh, regarding this. And so here are people emerging from the chamber after they were fed that high carbohydrate overfeeding period. So remember, they're, they're fed 200% of what they should eat. Um, and then they come out of the chamber, so, you know, their relative degree of hunger should be that great. But you can see um, that the percent increase in energy expenditure, so individuals who actually increase their energy expenditure more after the high carbohydrate overfeeding reported being hungrier. So that's a bit of a conundrum. So why would that be the case? So we actually, this... We actually had an inkling of why this might happen. I'm going to take you back a little bit to um, one of our other measures that we do on our unit, which is we can measure energy intake quite accurately, too. We use these automated vending machines. And we have studies where our unit, they have access to these vending machines for 72 hours. Um, they have a panel of foods they select. They vary by breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They vary by carbohydrate and fat. They can go to these vending machines whenever they want. They have their own special code. They punch the code in. Now it's actually a, um, it's a different system now. It's more modern than, than, it, than it appears there. So we know exactly what they took. They have to eat in the room. We know what they ate. We measure everything. We weigh everything. We know exactly how many calories they consume. This is an overfeeding paradigm, by the way. So people overeat on this all the time. And, they, and sometimes they overeat dramatically. So we've had some people who eat 9,000 calories a day. <laughs> However, it's very reproducible. So when we when we you know so we, we measure this, we discharge people, we bring them back a year later, they overeat to the same degree. So even though it's an overeating paradigm, it's very it's very reproducible. So it, it does measure some innate ability of what people will naturally eat at least under these conditions. And so we use this all the time. We use this in the intervention studies, but we also are interested the other side of the energy balance equation, which some would argue is the more important, is what controls energy intake. Um, and we have done a lot of studies. So these studies, so I just want to back up a minute. So these are shorter, these are only, you know, only 10 days for us. That's like nothing. Um, so we meet people, they have sort of a baseline um, stabilization period. They undergo an all glucose tolerance test, and they spend 24 hours, again, in our whole room indirect calorimeter, our chamber. And they measure energy expenditure. This is just under energy balance. We're not overfeeding them. After that, they leave the metabolic chamber, and then they can eat from this ad libitum vending machine model. They can eat whatever they want. Um, and for a long time, we, we actually had a difficult time determining why people ate what they did. But we began to understand it, and it's a long story why we looked at this. We actually started to look at the relationship of their energy expenditure and what they were eating. So this is percent weight maintenance energy needs is essentially the percent of calories they overate compared to what we think they should eat. So essentially the calories they ate when they were eating the ad libitum uh, portion of the vending machine divided by the calories we feed them on admission based on a formula that we use. And we adjust their admission calories to maintain their weight. And so, in other words, if someone's eating 150% of their weight maintenance energy needs or 80-50% more of the calories they need when they're on this ad libitum uh, vending machine, and so you can see that, one, people overeat a lot on this system. But actually, it's pretty strongly associated with their energy expenditure. Uh, and that's 
still the case even if you adjust the energy expenditure for body size, which means that um, uh, people who have a higher energy expenditure, even after you adjust out their body size requirements, tend to eat more. But there's also variance around this line. So there's some people who overeat compared to their measured energy expenditure and some people who undereat. Now this may seem, you know, a lot of people are like, well, obviously people who, you know, some people overeat relative to their energy needs and some people undereat. Um, and if you can measure this, right? So here's just, this is just a graph. So if you measure their energy expenditure compared to their energy intake, and you can measure the degree to which they vary on this line, right? People who overeat relative to their energy expenditure should gain weight compared to those who undereat, right? And that's actually the case. So if you look at uh, people who have had follow-up in our studies, so if you look at the uh, energy intake adjusted for their energy expenditure, so if you essentially look at this residual value, individuals who overeat relative to their energy expenditure gain weight over time. So what's remarkable about this isn't so much this concept. I think we would all agree that if you eat more than you burn, you're going to gain weight. It's the fact that we can actually measure it, because these are measurements done at two separate times. And then we can quantify it, and that has anything to do with anybody's weight gain. And so we term this idea energy sensing. And so what we would say is that individuals who are up here who eat more than they, their measured energy expenditure have a deviation in energy sensing that predisposes, predisposes them to weight change. And so we think this is why part of the reason individuals why we see the high carbohydrate results we saw is that there, in addition to this thrifty phenotype that we've identified, um, uh, not only involves energy expenditure, but also involves uh, sensing of energy intake. And so thrifty individuals don't just have uh, inability to compensate their energy expenditure for overfeeding or fasting, but they also have a deviation in their ability to sense their energy intake over time. And so, actually, our next series of studies is going to involve just those kinds of issues. So, at least in our studies, we feel like we found evidence for thrifty versus spendthrift energy expenditure phenotype based on the responses of 24-hour overfeeding uh, vary between individuals and are related. Um, we feel that low-protein overfeeding in particular is a very useful tool for uncovering uh, these energy expenditure phenotypes, and I can tell you that our next step is we're going to give we're going to give people FGF21 is available, and many companies are actually looking at it as a diabetes treatment, uh, and we're going to look at it as a tool to sort of make thrifty people more spendthrift. Um, and then the other important factor we're, that we're doing is we're looking directly at this energy sensing idea, uh, and energy sensing in a number of different ways. One is we're going to manipulate people's energy expenditure. Uh, in the first phase using cold exposure to see if they eat more and to see if that varies. Uh, and then we're going to try to uncover, we're going to do more measurements of energy sensing to try to uncover what underlies this, because we think this will lead to different pathways for understanding why people t have a predisposition to overeat. Um, I have a huge unit that helps me a great deal. And so obviously the work I'm presenting is the work of tons of other people who are, first of all, much smarter than me. Um, uh, and remember, we have a whole, we have a staff, we have a full-time nursing staff, lab staff, metabolic staff, all of who contribute to this work. Uh, and we couldn't do it, I could not do it without these people who are incredibly dedicated. And I just want to point out a few people who have done um, a huge amount of work uh, on this. Um, one is Marie Thurl, who was a, a actually also trained in New York and trained at Columbia. Is no longer uh, faculty with me, but did a lot of the work on the energy expenditure. Paolo Piaggi is one of my staff scientists. Um, and is currently the principal investigator of one of our protocols. Um, and uh, Susie Votruba, who's our, our clinical research dietitian, who is the principal investigator for one of the studies I showed you. And then um, I also want to point out, so you can imagine that anytime you, pre you propose to your lab staff that you're going to measure calories in stool, or to your nursing staff that they're shocked and horrified. And now we do this all the time. And my lab supervisor, Shannon Parrington, has been with me for years, uh, is now, I would say, to her ultimate chagrin, world famous for these measurements. And so people, people will actually send us stool samples to measure their calories. 
And she always tells, she's a very serious young woman, and she always says, this is not what I wanted to become famous for. And I'm like, well, you don't have that. <laughs> um, so uh, obviously I couldn't do all this work without uh, a dedicated research unit. And I'll stop there. Some relatives uh, tried down Mexico who live high up, right. who are sort of skinny yeah. compared to the Pimas. Uh, they ever been with this? Yeah, so that yes, so the Mayacabo Pimas are very closely genetically related to Eel River Pimas. And yeah, they, they have looked at rates of diabetes and I think some genetic markers and stuff. And I think they've even looked at energy expenditure using doubly labeled water. You know, I'm, I, the reason they don't have as much diabetes, at least, is, you know, they live in completely different conditions. So they, you know, they're in a very agricultural, rural setting, uh, in a state of almost, I want to say food deprivation, but, you know, they have to do all their own farming and stuff. So their lifestyle is significantly different. And when you do doubly labeled water measurements, their physical activity is hugely different compared to Eel River Pimas and their lifestyle and food intake is different. So they are genetically related. You know, they're, they're, as they get more civilized, their rates of diabetes prevalent, rates of diabetes are rising. So, but they haven't been looked at in terms of energy expenditure. I'm just trying to get my head around this metabolic chamber sort of peaks on end. Because I think that the metabolic chamber is what the metabolic They're only in it for a day. Oh. Oh, they're there a for day a day. At a time. They're not like... They go outside. They have kind well, of they're on our unit, so they're, they're admitted. To, so I guess I should explain. So they're admitted to our unit. We have rules. Okay. They're on our unit for ten weeks, and intermittently we put them in this metabolic chamber for measurement of energy expenditure. Now, on our unit, they are. I don't. They're not captive there. That's illegal. Um, <laughs> uh, they are asked to stay and follow our rules, and so we don't. We ask them not to exercise. They have to eat everything we give them. Um, you know, they uh, supervised. <laughs> yeah. Vitamin D? No. <laughs> but we feed them. Yeah. I mean, so yes, obviously, these are special people. They are reimbursed. They are compensated. Um, and you know, I, I think in this, um, in the business that I'm in, I, I would guess I would say that there are a lot of people who do this as professionally. Um, and they, I mean, you know. Uh, and, and they should be compensated. I mean, these are the, the people who join our studies. I mean, there are a lot of people who are local and do it for a lot of different reasons, but there's a bunch of professionals out there. They're also the ones taking your meds for the first time. You know, they're going to, I mean, you know, they're the ones who are t doing the phase one study where they take the meds and see if there's a side effect. So. You have the, uh, showed in that initial diagram that you have something Yes, there's a radar detector. Yes. So, but there is a So we, we do see we do see a signal of activity change that is related to these phenotypes. But I, the thing that I want to emphasize is that the when we calculate the amount of calories that spontaneous activity accounts for, it's really small um, and does not account cannot account for the weight loss. So even though people who are more spendthrift tend to be a little less sedentary on our unit, you know, because we have activity monitors. It, the degree of that is tiny, and and I know I, I, I know Jim Levine. I've seen his studies about non-exercise activity thermogenesis and how much it changes overfeeding. We have never seen that degree of change with overfeeding. Um, and and now, you know, I guess you could argue we have a more sedentary population, but even the motion detectors in our chamber, which measure every movement, I mean, you can stand there and move your pinky and it'll detect it. The amount of movement goes on is pretty small. So even though it's related, it just doesn't account for a huge amount of calorie expenditure. So, so in the beginning, I thought I heard you say that these were all of these kind of media. Maybe I misunderstood. Uh, were were these studies? So the, the inpatient study was, an, uh, so we have a bunch of arms of work. The inpatient study was, you know, these individuals in a weight loss arm. 
the outpatient I studied, study I showed you was a diverse group, so they were lean to obese. So the people that you guessed mean typically were spent less equally? Yes. So so the the question always is so this is a good so the question always is is how could obese people be spent I think. That's what you're asking. Well, I'm, or, I'm thinking of people who uh, you will see who eat huge amounts of food that never get over. Yes, some of the other people who exist. They well, I, there are people who will gain less weight if you overfeed them, but there aren't people. But everyone gains weight. Right. But there is some variation. Well, that's if you select the really thin pieces, mm -hmm. you'll get the better size. So separate. So exercise is a separate thing. Yeah. But if you take, so we, we, we have. A, I didn't show you these this data because it's. But yes, we have done this. Um, and so people who are uh, sort of congenitally lean, um, if you overfeed them, there is a similar variation in weight gain that is correlated with their baseline energy expenditure changes. And so you can find these people, but but they do gain. I mean, everyone gains weight. But there is, a, again, a, the same with the weight loss, there's a variation. And then just the ethnicity and the people you're studying, they're, they're, they're not even, it's just a population. It's a, it's a mix of, yeah, so we get, because we are in Phoenix City Medical Center, and because of the history, we do get about, in our studies, about 30% Native American, but the rest are Caucasian, African American, non-Hispanic white. So it's, a, it's about a third Native American, a third uh, white, and then the rest African American. Non-Hispanic, uh, not non or Hispanic, yes, of uh, other races. Yeah. You talk about entering school. Uh, is there any have you done any studies on microbiome? <coughs> we, differences? we actually we have. So we have we have a lot of school studies looking at microbiome. Um, for this these particular studies, yes, we have their schools. We have um, we actually are in the have measured the microbiome in these schools. We did it through a company, and the results just looked horrendous. So we're actually collaborating with ASU to do it correctly. They have a big microbiome core facility there, and so we're going to look at microbiome changes in stool calories. There are some interesting associations of the stool calorie loss with some of these phenotypes that we're trying to figure out. Overall, I we have some separate studies that look just at microbiome and whether how much that affects stool calorie loss. And I'm not convinced, although I know there's a lot of you know, interest in the microbiome. I'm not convinced that it has, at least in terms of calorie absorption, that has a huge effect. Just one follow-up question. You have great reviews of the Oh, uh, you know, so the, the cards definitely probably have more issues than the, you know, the whole room indirect calorimeter does um, because there's, I think, more user variability and things like that. Uh, if you maintain the card and test it and do the, you know, I, I can tell you these chambers are pain in the ass to maintain. And the cards actually have similar issues, but I think people don't do the testing required. If you do the right kind of testing and make sure that you're calibrating correctly, um, you can get very good reproducibility within 5%. But yeah, there's more user differences. We've looked at thyroid hormone and whether these predict any of these changes, and we've found very little effect. Yeah. Oh, sorry.